Well, thank you, Giorgio, for, for inviting me here, and thank you, all the organization, for, for this conference. Um, what I am going to discuss is the, uh, how we can uh, assess climate change impacts and risks in a situation where uncertainty uh, is very high. What we are interested in is basically the effects of climate change on the land surface processes uh, where we can face the, the, the most important risks. Floods, extreme events, landslides, droughts, ecosystem uh, changes in ecosystem processes, uh, loss of ecosystem services, and so on and so on. Now, most of these impacts are in fact related to changes in the hydrological cycle, which is uh, important. So it's uh, the, the, the common thread uh, between all these, uh, these different types of impacts. And uh, so what, what we do when we try to estimate uh, the uh, future effects of climate change, of climate variability on land surface processes. Typically, we have um, start from a global climate models. The only tool, it's a very imperfect tool, but the only tool we have to, to make projections for future, which are global and with high enough spatial and temporal resolution, uh, are global climate models. There is an old industry of global climate models, international programs and, and so on and so on. So there are international uh, um, activities, initiatives such, such as the uh, Climate Model Intercomparison Project, which is now at the number five, I mean the fifth uh, version. And so all these, these uh, results can be downloaded and used to what? Used to drive impact models land surface, ecosystems, floods, and so on. There is a problem, though. So we need a model for the climate, and we need a model for the impact. There is a problem that uh, most climate models currently have a resolution which is of the order of 70 kilometers, between 40 and 100. So the last generation of climate models have a, has a resolution of spatial resolution of 70 kilometers. But, in fact, the, the climate change impacts and risk usually happen at very small scales, scale of one kilometer, two kilometer, five kilometers or, or less. So we have a scale mismatch between these two uh, pieces of the puzzle. I mean, the climate models, climate is studied and, and uh, estimated at large scales. The impacts usually happen at small scale. So we need climate downscaling. Uh, climate downscaling is a bridge between the climate models, the global climate models, and the, uh, the impact models. And there are various approaches for these. Many, I mean, this is just uh, a few of them. The, the most common approach right now is dynamical downscaling, where you nest a regional climate model into the global climate model, and you reach a resolution which can go from 40 to 4 kilometers, more or less. Or you have other uh, approaches, which are statistical downscaling and uh, stochastic uh, rainfall downscaling. And I will briefly go through all of them. Dynamical downscaling, you take a piece of the globe, and then you nest a regional model, like, like this one, into uh, a global model. And so you get high, high resolution, but you basically have the same equations, more or less same kind of physics. Sometimes you have a better physics here represented, but often it's very similar. Uh, an example uh, for, for Europe is the, um, oh, you need both. Is the, the um, uh, Proteus model, which is a, a, a blend uh, of the Reg CM3, which is one of the most popular uh, atmospheric climate models developed uh, first at NCAR and then at ICTP, and uh, an ocean model, which is the MIT model, and this is a joint venture of ENEA and, uh, and ICTP. And so it, it gives you a resolution of about 30 kilometers. It's an hydrostatic model, so it does not include much new physics with respect to the global models, but has higher resolution. This is not enough, though. 30 kilometers is not enough for studying impacts. So there are other attempts, oops, uh, such as using non-hydrostatic models. Here is the example of WARF, the Weather Research and Forecast Model. Uh, and then this is a simulation, a 30-year-long simulation that was uh, performed at our institute uh, and uh, with resolution of uh, four kilometers over all Europe. So four kilometers are not enough for small uh, catchments, but they start to be uh, more, more interesting than, than 30. 
What is the problem, however, with these, uh, with these climate models is the fact that the amount of data that are produced is huge. It's, you know, it's, it's hundreds of terabytes of, of data, which is really difficult to manage, and they require enormous amount of CPU time, and very often you can do one, or at most two, realizations. Well, we all know that, especially as most case, climate uh, variability is highly, uh, I would say, chaotic or stochastic, depending upon your view, and then you need an ensemble of simulations. And you cannot get an ensemble of simulations with, with this high resolution. You can with 30 kilometers. There is a European project that's called Ensembles. It's an old project. There's a newer one, which is called Cordex. They provide multi-model uh, ensembles, but multi-model means that the models are different. And so you don't really know whether you are describing. I mean, the model world is different from one model to another. So there are a lot of this is one avenue, but there are a lot of problems with this kind of models. Another way is to use statistical downscaling, which is probably more familiar to you. And it's basically the idea that you, you look at the data today, you have large-scale predictors, like coming from the reanalysis or the global climate models, and then you have a local predictant, which can be rainfall in a given valley or something. And then over the historical period, you use some stat statistical models, such as generalized linear model or something. And then you get a relationship between these two, a relationship which is true only at a very local scale. It cannot be true at a much larger scale or for another valley. It's true for that valley. And then you, you take the large scale predictors coming from the, the, the projection, future projections, and then you apply the same GLM, and then you get the predictions for your valley. Now, of course, there are two drawbacks with this. The first one is that this works only for a given place. And the second is that you assume stationarity in time of, the, uh, of this uh, relationship between the large case and the small case, the predictor and the predictor, which is not assured. You don't know. So you can try to test it over the historical period if you have enough, a long enough uh, time series. But usually uh, you assume that the relationship, not that the climate is stationary, but that the relationship between the predictor and the predictant is stationary in time. Then you may have also stochastic downscaling, which has been developed mainly for, uh, for rainfall. And then for rainfall, basically, you, you notice that uh, uh, rainfall is highly intermittent in space and time, so normal standard interpolation procedures do not work. And so basically what you do, you try to do a, a um, stochastic interpolation, intermittent interpolation, using value different methods. For example, you can uh, build these, the first models, the first methods were based on uh, placing uh, rain cells with a given shape. Then people invented multifractal cascades. Then other people invented the, the kind of uh, simple stochastic process I will, I will uh, discuss in a moment. This is not, so this is taking the GCM or the regional climate model and generating a rainfall field which is compatible with the statistical properties of la a large case and as the right statistical properties of small case, as you may test with on, on study cases. Of course, this is not the future. This is one possible future because there is no determinism in this procedure. It's a stochastic process. So the only thing you can do is really to um, uh, use this to generate ensemble of, ensembles of possible futures. So you, you look at the statistics, at the probability of uh, uh, going beyond a certain threshold, probability of flood, or probability of a certain runoff, but not, is not the, the future. The, what, the method that is a method that is so widely used now, you take basically the, the properties of the large scale field. Here is the slope, the power spectrum, which is usually sort of power lowish. I mean, there are hundreds of papers saying whether rainfall has a power loss spectrum or not. We don't care so much about that from a practical, practical point of view. It's sort of power law -ish. I mean, there are so many errors in the problem that even if it's not exactly, we don't care. So we take a, an estimate uh, of, the, of this slope and you propagate it uh, to small scales. So you generate a stochastic, and then you put random phases. So you generate a, a stochastic field, which is Gaussian because it has random Fourier phases. But so you want a non-Gaussian because precipitation is non-Gaussian, so you apply a nonlinear transformation. The simplest one 
is the exponential, which is give, give you, gives you a log normal distribution. If you want it to be fancier, you apply other, other transformations. And so you get basically uh, an image of the field at, at very small scales. What does this procedure uh, uh, does to your, your, uh, to your field? Well, this is an example for the area where we are. So this is Piedmont, and they, they are um, managed by ARPA, Piemonte, there are about uh, more than 100 rain gauges in the last 50 years. And so you can build, uh, and they built, in fact, a 10 kilometers uh, grid with, with, uh, with rainfall. But you can look at the individual, uh, the individual rain gauges, so it's a number of them. And so the, bl oops, the black is, uh, no, sorry, the red, is the PDF of precipitation. The, you see two curves. These are the 5% and 95% uh, uh, limits of the distribution. And the blue is what is generated by Proteus. Typically, a rain gauge has a size of the rain gauge, while the, the original model has a, has a grid size of 30 kilometers, so it's very large. So typically, you eliminate extreme events. You lose the tails of the, of the rainfall distribution. If you apply the stochastic downscaling procedure that uh, I was uh, discussing before, this one, and you go to a size, let's say, of a kilometer or less a kilometer, then you get the black, uh, the black uh, curves, which again, 5% and 95%. So basically what you have done, you have uh, um, expanded the PDF given by the model to uh, uh, include extreme events which fit very well with the, uh, with the, observe, with the observations, with the observed data. Now, of course, what you need here is, that, is to know the slope of the power spectrum. But this can be obtained from the large-scale uh, large information. The assumption here is that you have extended, you extend without changing in, in, in power law, without changing power, so you simply extend. So it's a very simple assumption, but it seems to work in, in, in uh, several instances. So basically what you do at this point is that you um, start from the global model and you don't go directly to the, uh, to the impact uh, model, but you first downscale through a regional climate model to, um, to a resolution which is as high as you can achieve, as you can uh, uh, cope with. So uh, a typical hydrostatic model is 20, 30 kilometers, or I show the case of the four kilometer wharf, but that is one simulation. And then you apply some form of statistical or stochastic downscaling, and then this is the typical rainfall field generated by a, a regional climate model, and this is the product after the downscaling. You see, you generate the extremes, and then you apply these to the impact model. Okay, so this is more or less what's happening, what most people now are doing to study impacts at small scale, with a lot of technical issues, such as how to incorporate uh, orography at the scale smaller than the grid size of the model, because the, the model does have orography, but the incorporating orography in the downscaling procedure is not always simple. There are attempts, there are ways, but not necessarily working. So, we are happy. We have a, we have a big, uh, we, have, we have this nice uh, procedure. We, you may ask what's happening to the little stream in my little valley where my grandparents were living. Uh, it's a catchment of 10 square kilometers, and we do the downscaling, and we tell you about that. Well, there are, in fact, several troubles, and so the situation is much less uh, pleasant than it could seem from the first part of the talk. And the troubles basically are that you need data to validate the models, large-scale data to validate the large-scale and regional models, the climate models. So these are four, six data sets. Uh, this is Aphrodite, CRU, GPCC. These are all based on more or less the same rain gauges. This is the area of Himalaya. Okay, here, in, here is uh, Nepal. And uh, this area is especially difficult for the very complicated orography, but it's especially important for 
uh, for many, many reasons. For water resources, for example. I mean, if rivers streaming out of the Tibet and Himalaya bring water to probably more than one billion and a half people. Uh, they bring water to China, to India, to Pakistan, and to, and to other countries. So, a lot of people are now looking into this area, which is, uh, as I say, uh, crucial also from a climatic point of view. And then uh, it's, very, uh, it's also very diverse because the Himalaya here is very different from the Karakoram here. I mean, the, meteorologically, this is dominated by the summer monsoon, while this is dominated by the western weather patterns that come from the Mediterranean, the Middle East during winter. So there are two completely different areas. In fact, precipitation here happens mainly uh, in summer, while here happens mainly in, in late winter, early spring. But let's look at this. So these are data sets from, from rain gauges. This is a satellite data set, TRIM. This is GPCP, which is putting together TRIM and GPCC. And this is an era interim reanalysis, one of the best uh, reanalysis. There are two big reanalysis products available, the, the, the ECMWF ones, which are uh, the ERA family, and the NSEP uh, US ones. So what you see, basically, is that they are all different. I mean, this is the ground truth. This is the ground truth uh, which you want to use for validate your model. And then if you, well, overall, yes, they all have some rain here, but look at the central Nepal. Here it's raining, here it's not raining. These are more or less the same data, simply interpolated in a different way. It's raining again, not, no, but very little. So, first uncertainty. When you validate your model, which data set you use? And then all data sets are, 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 can be very different. One of the reasons is the poor coverage of uh, rain gauges. There are few rain gauges in this area. And another reason is the fact that rain gauges above a certain elevation do not measure precipitation because they miss solid precipitation. They miss snow. Because, not, not because it's a matter of being heated or not. I mean, these are heated rain gauges, but the fact that the rain gauge itself deflects the wind locally, and raindrops are, uh, are not deflected much, and they go into the rain gauge. Snowflakes, which are much uh, fluffier, are uh, deflected together uh, with, the, with the wind, and so they do not get into the rain gauge. And there is an estimate that about half of precipitation is lost above the zero degree uh, ice line. The second... Uh, trouble is that you take an, a model, a global climate model. So there is similar fiber, as I was saying, there are tens of global climate model outputs. So somebody, I mean, many people, including us, were looking at the, uh, what are the, the spread in the, the spread in the, in the, in the projections in, uh, uh, given by these models. So this is the family of SIMIP5 models. Oops, sorry. This is the family of semi fine models for today, for precipitation, and, uh, and uh, for the future. This is the average of all the models. The two colors here are just two different scenarios for those who are interested in the RCP 4.5 and the RCP 8.5. But look at the enormous spread. I mean, precipitation in millimeters per day goes from uh, 1 to 13. So really, there is a, a, a huge spread in the precipitation uh, projected, uh, I would, wouldn't dare to say forecasted, projected by the models. So do you take the average? The average has no sense. These are very different models. Do you take one model? Which one? So this is another source of uncertainty. By the way, for those of you who are interested in the real world, these are the data sets in this area, provided that you believe the data sets as you can gather from the previous uh, from the previous slide. For temperature, similar problem. This is the spread in temperature. The, this is the summer in the Himalaya. Oh, uh, excuse me here, I just put the summer in the Himalaya and the winter in the Karakoram, which has the two most important rainfall seasons for this area. Uh, yep. So for temperature, it's the same thing. I mean, this is the spread in temperatures. This is the average, and you see that even the average does not correspond. There is a, what we call a cold bias. Models are colder than reality. So you have this kind of uncertainty. Then 
you have the uncertainty in the, uh, in the regional models. So these are simulations of the Pakistan flood of 2010, done with WARF, uh, nested into reanalysis at four kilometers. So very high resolution. And look at this, this PDF, this is the PDF, sorry, one minus CDF, one, one minus the cumulative uh, distribution function for rainfall. This, when you initialize the model from uh, uh, the reanalysis, boundary conditions, on uh, the day 28 of July, so the previous day, no? this is the big flood happened in 28 and 29th. And this is when you initialize with another version, always on the 28th, but coming from a previous simulation with a better representation of the, uh, of the um, boundary conditions. So, Look at the enormous difference between this and this, and both are different from TRIM, but you, you don't trust this. I mean, TRIM cannot reproduce that. Uh, simply changing the boundary conditions, simply changing the kind of free analysis and the, and the day of initialization, which is a serious uncertainty. I'm always going backwards. Okay. Then, Let's go to the downscaling, the third step in the chain of uncertainties. This is an old work that uh, we did, simply changing the slope of the power spectrum. Remember that we estimate this, the, power, the slope of the power spectrum and, you, and we propagate it. But of course, this estimate is sometimes uh, affect, I mean, it's affected by, by uncertainties, by errors, so you can change it a little bit. And so this tells you this is the, the tunnel uh, let's call it river stream uh, based in the tunnel of catchment and then not far from here you see it's more or less here and these are three different realizations of the, downs of the rainfall field taking the original choice of the slope of the power spectrum a flatter one and a, and a, and a steeper one and so you, you, you generate precipitation which is quite different and then this is basically the, the peak runoff uh, as a, in different choices. And then you see that for the extremes, you really go from this situation to this situation. This is the peak runoff uh, versus the measured, the, pr the, the predicted versus, versus the measured one. So in some cases, you predict uh, peak runoffs which are too small, and in other cases, which are too high. Of course, this is good, but I mean, you should decide whether you want to do it a priori or a posteriori. I mean, that's choosing at a posteriori the slope, which is better than the slope changes from one event to another. Okay. Then there is the, um, the, the, the impact model. We didn't discuss about the impact models. Uh, now, this is the example, an example which is not so much of, of uh, engineering geology, but it's uh, ecosystems. It's the population dynamics of the ptarmigan, which is an endangered bird in, in, uh, in the Alps. And these are three model projections which have been realized with minor changes in the choice of the predictors and all giving more or less the same archaic uh, information criterion. So all these models are basically equivalent. And then you see that this is indicating uh, extinction of the population. This is almost extinction, and this is wide oscillations. Now, it, all of them indica indicate a decrease of the population, but the amount of the decrease is highly dependent upon the model, uh, the impact model you choose. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, then, uh, another uh, example which is maybe closer to the interest of the audience, which is a very important, is forest fires, and another source of uncertainty. Now, if you read on the newspapers, it seems that everything is burning due to climate change. Uh, now, in fact, in Mediterranean areas, in most Mediterranean areas, the number of fires in the burned area is decreasing. But it is decreasing not because of climate change. It is decreasing because of human intervention, of better policies, prevention policies, uh, anti-ignition policies. And uh, so the, the human impact, not only through climate, but directly cannot be uh, discarded in, in impact models. So this is a series, a very good series from Catalonia. And, uh, and uh, this is the number of fires, and this is the burnt area in summer. And then basically you can build a model about that. I will not go into the details, but 
I mean, everything is available, but uh, where you have long-term changes which are due to human activities and climate trends, I mean, the, the long-term trends, and fluctuations which are due mainly to climate, local climate conditions. I mean, most of these fires are ignited by human action. Okay, so it's not natural. But the, 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 the ability to, to, uh, to cope with this fire does depend on climate variability. The, the fact that some ignition starts and some does not. In particular, it does depend from the analysis, the, the fluctuations I'm saying, on certainly the conditions of the current, concurrent summer. I mean, high, uh, hot and dry summers are more prone to fires. But also on, in Mediterranean areas, on the conditions two years before, because uh, on, the, on, the, on the previous springs and on three and two years before, because this is the production of the fine fuel which will be available for, for, being, uh, for, 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 for the fire. So there is fuel uh, flammability, which depends on the summer, on the current summer, and fuel availability that depends on the previous, previous conditions. But the interesting thing here is that, sorry about that. The interesting thing here is that looking at the current data, you see, these are the data in black, a negative trend in the number of fires. But if through statistical methods you, you distinguish between the trend associated with climate, making the hypothesis that the trend and the fluctuations have the same kind of dependence upon climate, and the trend which is ascribed to human intervention, well, if you put only climate, you would get this. While if you put also the human intervention, you, you don't eliminate it, you get this. So this is a good suggestion that, in fact, the number of fires is decreasing because of uh, human policies. But also it tells you that if you do projections taking into account only climate and not taking into account changes in the uh, human strategies and human policies, you can get completely wrong projections. For example, for the future, you get this projection with an increase of the number of fires. But these projections uh, take into account the current policies and the change in climate. So the change in climate is winning over the current policies. But probably and hopefully better policies will be adopted, so bringing back to a negative trend. The other thing that this plot shows is that the, in yellow is the uncertainty due to the ensemble of regional climate models. These projections were, used, uh, you, were made using a big ensemble of climate, regional climate models from the ensemble project, not just one. And the one in red is the uncertainty coming from using an ensemble of uh, uh, fire models. So also in this case, the uncertainty coming from regional climate models is larger than that coming from, is more important than coming from the, um, uh, the impact models. So there are no specific conclusion uh, because this is really a, a showing the state of the art. The first thing is that if you want to study impacts of global change, not only climate but also land use in, in general, you should take into account the scale mismatch between the uh, resolution of climate models and the, uh, the impact which take, take place at very small, impacts that take place at very small scale. The other thing is that there are huge uncertainties in data, uh, in climate models, in downscaling, in impact models, so you need to use an ensemble procedure. A single simulation is not enough. A single simulation of climate, a single simulation of uh, the impact model is not enough. And then it should always be accompanied by uncertainty estimates. To progress, we need two things. The first thing is to reduce the uncertainty of the data. So better data, more data, and very importantly, open access data. Open access is a crucial aspect which is emerging in the last uh, few years, but is absolutely needed to allow wide use of, of the data. This is for Europeans, but there is an estimate that about more than 95% of the data collected with money from European projects, so it's public money from us, 95% of the data are unavailable because they are not open, they are not public, they are forgotten in drawers, and this is a bad habit that should be modified and changed. 
There are international uh, initiatives for that. The most important one is GEO, GEOS, the, the Global Earth Observation System of Systems, which is a voluntary organization, including 90 governments and about 70 international organizations. National projects such as Next Data and other European initiatives such as the European Climate Research Alliance, which all, always cope with, with this issue. The other thing is that it's wrong to say that we don't know anything. We know a lot, but not enough. And then we should not focus only on applications. I mean, applications are crucial, but we need to have better knowledge, uh, better understanding of the processes at small scale, of the impacts of climate processes, and in general of the systems we want to, to, to forecast and we want to estimate. So research is absolutely needed. And in this, I would insist on the role on the interdisciplinarity and the need for the interdisciplinarity, which is typical of geosciences and uh, which is at the, at the core of the, that uh, group of uh, activities known as earth system science. And with this, I, I thank you.